Our scripture lesson today is from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. These words are familiar to us. We looked at them not long ago, but I want us to focus on them again today as I begin a new sermon series, a sermon series focused on courage. We will look through and read through the book of Philippians together over these next several weeks. We will dive deep into the book of Philippians, and I want to encourage you to read the book of Philippians, only four chapters long, an easy read. I will send out on our email list, as well as on our Facebook page and website, a reading guide to help us so that we can read along together. If you want to do a slow read, a deep dive, and Austin is planning on doing a Bible study where you can gather together with her and through Zoom, and do some discussion about this wonderful letter that Paul wrote to that church. But I want to start today with the courage to be vulnerable that Paul talks about in this second chapter, beginning with verse 5. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my friends... I'm here to tell you, this was one of the hardest sermons I've ever had to write. I really, really struggled with it. I read, I listened to podcasts, I prayed, I sat, I stared. My husband Richard said, aren't you finished with that sermon yet? I said, not quite. I'm really having a hard time. My daughter, Michelle, called and she said, wouldn't you like to go out with baby Joe and me to the zoo or to the pool or something and have fun? And I said, well, as soon as I finish this sermon, when are you going to finish? I'm giving myself a deadline. I'm going to be finished by 1230 Saturday. She said, okay. Two o'clock Saturday, we finally made it out to the park. She said, how is your sermon? I haven't finished it yet. (laughs) Well, what's the problem, Mom? I don't know. I'm just, I'm really having a hard time with this, which shouldn't surprise me. Because vulnerability, just thinking about it, reading about it, hearing about it, brought up to me my own vulnerabilities, my own insecurities, those things that I don't want people to know about me, those things that I try to hide and forget about in my life. I was confronted with the fact that I worried that this sermon wouldn't be good enough, that this sermon would disappoint you, that I wouldn't say things eloquently enough or appropriate enough or that I'm not smart enough to convey what needs to be conveyed here. All of those old insecurities just kept popping up. I was concerned about disappointing people and then next Sunday nobody would show up for church. (laughs) Offerings would go down. It'd all be my fault. You see, the word vulnerable means being capable of being wounded. So whenever we take a risk in life, whenever we let others peek behind the curtain of who we really are 
to see something about us that we don't even want to admit about ourselves. We get sweaty palms. We get shaky in the knees. And there is a tendency to just hide from it, to run away, and to not do anything. Often, our vulnerability manifests itself in anxiety or in anger. When we feel helpless about the uncertainty of a future or how we're going to be received, I can just imagine young children starting school for the very first time tomorrow, going to a new school, going to a new classroom, and that anxiety, that vulnerability, will I have any friends? Will the teacher like me? Will I be able to do this work? Is it going to be okay in this school year? That fear of not being accepted, of being misunderstood, of being rejected or demeaned. It's a not-so-well-hidden secret that all of us get a little bit scared at times in life. We get scared that maybe we're not going to live up to certain things or we're not capable of certain things or things aren't going to turn out the way we want them to. Dr. Brene Brown, many of you know her and have heard her TED Talk or have read her books. She's a professor, a researcher, and a storyteller. She's written many books, and she spent the last 20 years doing research, studying vulnerability, courage, shame, and worthiness. And she notes that because we equate vulnerability with weakness, some of us have developed some very unhealthy ways of dealing with our vulnerability. She noted, in fact, that here in the United States, we are the most addicted, in debt, overweight, and medicated adult population in U.S. history. You see it, don't you? And she says that that is because we try to hide our vulnerability in these ways. We either try to numb them with alcohol or food or drugs or Netflix marathons or something that I like to call shopping therapy. We don't like those feelings of grief and disappointment and pain and shame and guilt. And so we try to numb ourselves, distract ourselves with all of these other things so that we don't feel those negative feelings as much. But she says the problem is you cannot selectively numb your feelings. So if you try to numb the negative feelings, you also suppress your ability to feel love and joy and peace and contentment. So that little shopping spree you go on, the thrill only lasts like that, and then it's gone. And then you're more in debt, so you get more depressed. You feel more vulnerable and ashamed. So what do you do? You go out and buy some more things. Because it felt good in the moment, but it never lasts. The other way that we try to hide from our vulnerability is we try to tell ourselves that everything that we think is uncertain is really certain. And this is the way I see it manifest in our world today. For many, religion has moved from being a belief in faith in the unseen and mystery to a certainty that I'm right and you're wrong, get over it and shut up. You hear it, don't you? And we see it in politics. That's what politics has turned into today. No more discourse, no more discussion, just blame, blame, blame. And blame is a way of discharging our pain and our discomfort by pinning it on somebody else. But the way that I typically deal with my vulnerability is I try to be perfect. Perfectionism. That's why it took me so long to figure out what to say today. Some of you may turn towards perfectionism. But as Dr. Phil likes to say, how's that working for you? It doesn't work for me. 
I should know by now at my age that I am not perfect and never will be, and other people already know it. In the text we read today from Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul quotes what is considered one of the earliest Christian hymns. And he does so to remind the people in Philippi that they are to live into the words that they sing. It's not just music to entertain them. They are to live in to these words. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Like Jesus, don't try to think so highly of yourselves. Be honest. Have the courage to be honest about who you are and be vulnerable enough to risk loving others even when it means that you will suffer, even when it means that your love and your efforts will be rejected by others. Risk being vulnerable enough to serve and care and be there for others. So what is it about our world and even the church that prevents us from having the courage to be vulnerable we say we are followers of Jesus Christ, and Paul tells us clearly here that we are to be like Christ, and we say we want to be like Christ. Why is it so hard for us to be honest about who we are and create environments where others can be comfortable with who they are, even within the church? My friend Frankie Garrick used to tell the junior high students that she taught in Sunday school that she knew that when those students came into her classroom in Sunday school with the little smiles on their faces and their parents waving to them at the door, that maybe it wasn't all like that on the car ride to the church. So she would ask them to role play what it was like at their house on the way to church that morning. And the kids would be honest in their role play. Mom and dad yelling at one another about who needed to get what done, where were the kids' shoes, fussing at different children for not getting out of bed on time, we're going to be late, come on, get your clothes on, or fussing about what somebody was wearing or about how they fixed their hair that day. And then the minute they got to car, it got to the church parking lot, miraculously, Everybody loved each other, and everything was hunky-dory, peachy keen. They walked out the car, and people said, Good morning, how are you? We're great. We're fine. We're a loving family. We're perfect. And that kind of mask leads others who come into the church who know that they are not perfect to feel that they don't belong in the church to feel that they are excluded from the church. How many of you have ever heard of a new kind of church called Bar Church? Anybody heard of Bar Church? Nobody? A few hands kind of not. You're like, mm, do I want to admit I've heard of Bar Church in the church? Well, Bar Church is a kind of movement where space is created inside of local bars for people to come and encounter God in a safe environment and in a new way. Now, clearly, being a part of a bar church is not a healthy place for all people, especially if substance abuse is one of your problems, right? But let me tell you about bar church. I was reading about a bar church in New Jersey, and the pastor of that church, Pastor Trevor, said this, he said, there's something about a space like this for folks that's created an atmosphere of vulnerability. The walls come down and people seem to open up. He said, I've heard from a mom sharing her guilt about the harm that was done to her child and her own shame over allowing that harm to take place. A gay man had the courage to come share his pain as a result from a church 
that had stopped loving him when he told them who he really was. And he wrestled with how and where to take his family to church so that they could worship God without putting his children through the same harm that he had faced. Across the table, we've shared times that we weren't able to forgive. We let folks be real without trying to fix them. We encourage one another to share our own stories of growth and of doubt, of questions. Multiple folks who have come here have sought out a place to encounter God that allowed them to be authentic their authentic selves. So I ask again, what is it about the world and the church in particular that prevents us from being authentic? The church should be a place of honesty, vulnerability, and acceptance. But sadly, that's not everyone's experience. And many seem silenced by a sense of shame and personal failure. As followers of Jesus, we are called to love, love others, and love ourselves. And yet, love takes courage. Our love takes commitment. Our love requires vulnerability. That's one of the reasons I'm very proud of this congregation. Because you took it upon yourselves to write a vision statement, to make it clear to yourselves and to others, who you are and how you will respond to one another. That you want to be that kind of congregation that is vulnerable enough to risk loving, vulnerable enough to stand up and speak out against the injustices in this world. As followers of Jesus, that's the kind of life we are called to live. The text we read today reminds us, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, a mind that loves and is vulnerable enough to risk speaking up when injustices take place. In the passage from Philippians 2, we see Jesus, who is God, does not assume to be better than anyone else, Instead, he humbles himself. He gives up the privileges of divinity by emptying himself into human experience. Through Jesus' courage to be vulnerable, he became just like you, just like me. Limited by time and by space. Limited in all the ways that we are. Limited in his living here and in his dying Limited in the expectations that others had of him, good or bad. God chose to be limited and to risk loving and being rejected and despised, spat upon and suffered. God chose not to just view the messiness of humanity from afar, but to get down in the messiness with us courage, and vulnerability. That's the kind of life we're called to live. A vulnerability that calls us to get down in the messiness of life, even though we want to turn off the news and not think about all the stuff that's going on in the world, even though we don't want to get involved in politics and be attacked or be labeled. Courage and vulnerability You see, courage is less about strength and more about a willingness to do that which frightens us. It compels us to act when we would rather not do anything than what we are called to do. There is no courage without vulnerability because there's no courage without risk. When we are vulnerable, we open ourselves to be hurt and to possibly lose But when we are vulnerable, we also open ourselves up to love and to friendship and to growth and to joy and to God's peace. So I want to ask you, what would you do if you were not afraid to be vulnerable and to risk? 
to risk others labeling you or judging you, to risk being hurt. If we were not consumed or diverted by our fears, I suspect that this world would be filled with more love and more joy and more peace, more hope, more healing. I suspect that none of our fears will ever completely go away, but that's where God's grace comes in, my friends. God's grace can control our fears just as proper exercise can control our weight. God's grace is abundant and does not run out. All we need to do is lean in to that grace. You see, as I looked through history, I remember that it took the courage to be vulnerable that led Clarence Jordan in the late 1950s to set up Konania Farm, a community of racial reconciliation in southwest Georgia. It took the courage of vulnerability for him to stand up to the KKK. It took courage for him to stay and rebuild that farm after it was burned and machine gun fire was commonplace. It took the courage of vulnerability for Dorothy Day, an unwed mother and journalist, to fight for the rights of the working poor in New York City. It took courage for her to write columns demanding that Christianity follow Jesus' footsteps and care for the poor. She had to confront the religious authorities of her day in order to start the Catholic Workers' Movement. And it took courage, the courage of vulnerability, for a man named Albert Simpson, who was senior minister of, of a prestigious Presbyterian church in New York City, to leave that church when that church refused to accept Italian immigrants in their church membership. He went on to establish the American Missionary Training Center. Courage. Courage does not mean we praise every act of bravado regardless of the motive or the results. For many foolish things have been done in the name of courage. Some things that feel like courage, like religious zealots who insist that everyone agree with their opinion, they're not courageous. It's really fear. When people are driven by fear, they'll do anything to protect their turf. So let us be clear. The courage to be vulnerable is following in the way of Christ, being willing to serve others. Courage is not limited to grand and illustrious movements. It takes courage for the mother of a child being bullied at school because of the child's sexual identity, for that mother to stand up and speak out and protect her child. It takes courage for women like Olivia Newton-John, who refused to give in to cancer's despair, to allow others to share in their journey of pain and suffering in order to help others be courageous and fight their own battle against cancer. In all our lives, my friends, there comes a time when we have to accept that our calling as followers of Jesus Christ is to recognize our vulnerability and to risk doing what we are called to do and made to do. And again, I know in many ways I'm speaking to the choir. You have shown as a congregation that you are willing to do the hard things and to stand up for justice and righteousness, but we can all grow in this. There's a country music song that is almost a theme song for having the courage to be vulnerable. It says, I hope you never fear the mountains in the distance, never settle for the path of least resistance. Living might mean taking chances, but they're worth taking. Loving might be a mistake, but it's worth making. 
And when you get the choice to sit out or dance, I hope you'll dance. I hope you'll dance. My dear friends, let us dance with courage and be the loving congregation that God knows we are and will give us the grace and strength to be, both now and forever. Amen.